And will you pray with me, please? Holy and almighty God, once more we say thank you for the breath of life you have given each and every one of us again this day, allowing us to rise from our slumber, gather in this holy place to be in your presence, to hear your word proclaim, and to seek to know your will for us in our lives. So speak to us now, dear God, for we are listening. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. How many people were able to watch any of the political conventions on television these past two weeks? I, myself, did not see most of either convention, not because I wasn't interested, but for another reason. They started too late at night for me, and by the time the news anchors had gone through all their initial talking amongst themselves and recalling some highlights of that day or the night before, by the time they had finished all of that and the speakers finally started, well, I was usually fast asleep on the couch and did not wake up again until they were all saying goodnight. I did, however, get to watch some of the speeches the next morning, usually around 4 a.m. when I wake up again, and could see reruns on PBS. And one of the speeches I saw this past week blew me away. So much so I have watched it over and over on YouTube. It was the speech given by the Reverend William Barber, President of the North Carolina chapter of the NAACP. If you did not see this speech, I encourage you to look it up and watch it, for it will be like going to church again. And one of the great lines from that speech, of which there were many, was when he said that he is concerned with those who say so much about what God says so little and say so little about what God says so much. The main thrust of all of our holy scriptures seek to focus ourselves and our lives on the goodness of God and how we should react to that goodness. And this is normally accomplished in two ways in Scripture, with wonderful stories about God's providence and provision for the people, and then with stories about the people taking care not to co-opt God's providence and provision for themselves. And so we get stories on the one hand about God creating a Garden of Eden full of beauty and tasty things to eat, And on the other hand, we get a story about how the first human beings thought they could do better for themselves and went ahead and ate the one fruit that was bad for them. We get to read stories about God redeeming the people after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, carrying them safely not only through a great sea but a great desert, only to be followed up with stories of how the people complained and complained about their circumstances and thought they could do better by crafting a golden calf and worshiping it. On the one hand, we get a story about a Messiah being born in a stable to lowly yet humble parents, how the angels sang out glory to the newborn king, to be followed up with stories about people refusing to accept the Messiah among them and constantly seeking to kill him, which they ultimately do. And of course, we know the story of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, defeating the power of sin and death forever, only to be followed up with stories about how even in those first few years after Christ's resurrection, people start to turn away from God once again to embrace the immediate gratification of the pursuit of wealth and the paganistic rituals of idol worship. 
These are the things Paul was talking about when he wrote to that small church in Colossae, when he said, Set your hearts on things above, not earthly things. Put to death, he says, these things that are not good for you. Immorality, lust, evil thoughts, and greed. Greed, which he defines as being its own form of idolatry, meaning worshiping money as if it were a god. And he goes on to say, get rid of all things that do not imitate Christ in your life. Anger and rage and malice and slander, filthy language, lies. And clothe yourselves in the knowledge of the image of the Creator. Greed, slander, lies, anger, these are the things about which God says so much. But all too often we heed so little. Well, some may say, well, wait a minute there, preacher man. Those are the things Paul said much about when he was writing to an ancient church in Turkey. Things are different now, and I don't need to listen to that. To which I would reply, really? You don't see greed, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, and lies as problems in our society today that need to be addressed so that our nation and our children do not slip so far from God that they ultimately deny all saving grace? And how is it that what Paul was saying in the first place were actually words first spoken by Jesus, the Son of God, especially greed and idolatry? For Jesus said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all forms of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Greed is something about which God says much. Jesus goes on to tell the story of a farmer whose land produced abundant crops and how his greed cost him his life. But before I think we can actually understand this story so that we may learn from it and not suffer the same fate, we first have to understand what the farmer's error actually was. For he is not portrayed as a wicked man. That is, he had not gained his wealth illegally or by taking advantage of other people. And he's not portrayed as particularly greedy. In fact, he seems surprised that his land produces so abundantly and begins to wonder what should he do with all these extra crops? I mean, what is wrong, we might ask, about building larger barns to store the extra he had been blessed with so that he may have some food available when times are leaner? I mean, don't we do the same? I mean, do we not even encourage young people to, to start savings accounts? And isn't good stewardship of our money often described as putting some away for later, ignoring the desires of the right now? Is anything wrong with any of that? Of course not. But notice, those are not the things the farmer did wrong from which we should learn. What the farmer did wrong was to ignore the role of God in his good fortune and instead think that it was all about him. Listen again to the farmer's consistent focus throughout this conversation he has with himself in his own head when he says, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I know I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones where I will store all of my grains and my goods. And now I will say to myself, look, I now have a lot so I can eat, drink, be merry, and relax. The relentless use of the first-person pronouns I, me, my betray a preoccupation with self. 
He gives no thought to using the abundance to help others. No expression of gratitude for his good fortune. And no recognition of God in there at all. The farmer has fallen prey to worshiping the most popular idol of all, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. This leads to the farmer's second mistake when he believes that, by his, that through his wealth and possessions he can secure his own future. Well, whatever our technological advances have been over the millennia, whatever our intellectual prowess or cultural achievement has become, each of us, and indeed the entire human race as a whole, remain contingent, vulnerable, fragile beings. Human life, for this reason, is fraught with uncertainty and insecurity. And perhaps it is for this very reason that we are tempted to strive for a measure of control over our own lives through our own efforts and accomplishments. The farmer is called foolish, not because of his wealth or ambition, but rather he assigns to finite things infinite value. He has tried to insulate himself from fate and fortune through the storing up of his wealth, and he comes up empty. He has everything he thinks he needs and more. And yet, at the end, which for him came that very night, it all proved inadequate. Well, what concerns me, my friends, is that we often only look at the surface of things and get it wrong. Some read the letters of Paul and think, that's not for me. I'm a follower of Jesus, not Paul. Some read the parables of Jesus, in which he says much about greed and selfishness, and think, I knew it, the only thing the church is interested in is money. And in the end, just like the farmer, what we come up with ourselves proves inadequate. But when we listen deeply to the things God says much about, we realize that it is the state of our souls and ultimately our happiness that God cares about. In seminary, I had a friend who would come up and ask me, how is it with your soul today? A question that always took me aback a little at first because no one had ever asked me that before. But as time went by and I became accustomed to caring for my own soul, when my friend would ask me, how is it with your soul today? I could begin to answer, it is well. It is well with my soul. Jesus, the best friend any of us could ever have, is asking you, how is it with your soul today? To answer that question, we must first ask ourselves, is our life about grabbing all we can for ourselves or giving back great, gratefully what we have received? Is our stance toward life one of fear or one of faith? Are we enjoying the gifts God gives to each and every one of us each and every day or constantly looking at what another has and wishing that was ours? Have we made our relationships with God and others a priority? Or do we put them off for some other day because we're busy with our problems right now? Thank you. And when we speak, do we speak with a tone of malice and anger in our voice? 
Or do we refrain from using foul and slanderous language? And to puff ourselves up, do we say much about what God says so little and say little about what God says so much? It's very easy in our day and age to think that the world rests upon our shoulders alone. To worry about paying bills and letting anger grow inside of us because you know what? Hey, well guess what? If I don't do it, who will? It's very easy to become discouraged and forget to not just expect blessings from the Lord but then to bless the Lord in return. That is why we need each other. That is why I believe the church and its foundation will never slip away. For without it, we may surely become fools. We need one another to help us in our daily walk. We need one another to help care for our souls. All of us, every single one of us, is in constant motion along a continuum that ranges from absolute total faith and dependence upon God to questions and doubt that lead to worry and anxiety. Most of us are in here somewhere, not out here. Myself, I know that when I am journeying along that continuum to the edge that leads to worry, I will think to myself, this is crazy. You should know better than this. You've been here before. But all too often, I don't really know any better. And it takes one of you to help me see things clearly again. Just like my friend in seminary, I need you to help me remember to care for my soul as much as I care for paying my bills and saving a few dollars. And as time goes by, I hope I remember to ask you more often, how is it with your soul today? And from my own experience, I can tell you that when you focus on what God says much about, it will become easier and easier to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we give you thanks for leading us and loving us when we get lost in the distractions of our lives. Help us to listen for your voice, to be drawn to the fundamentals of life, of ceasing to do evil, learning to do good, refraining from malice and anger, seeking always to act in love. We lift our hearts and prayers for all of those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. May the healing power of your Holy Spirit enter and heal from within. We commit ourselves to you, O Lord, to be a thankful and caring people, to renew ourselves once more in your grace. Bless us this morning with a sense of gratitude that enables us to carry out the holy work you continue to call us to do. And bless what we have to give, our tithes and our offerings. Help us to realize the good things we can do for others, confident that we too are already taken care of. We ask all these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.